Good morning. Uh, my name is Ashraf Roji. I am an intensive care consultant in Weeps Cross Hospital in UK. I am also a lecturer and consultant of intensive care medicine in Egypt. Today I will talk about the cardiac affection in COVID-19. The objective and the focus of this lecture will be how the COVID-19 can affect the heart. This is the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. There was studies and reports coming from China reporting an incidence of cardiac injury. So this study, for example, they report 20% incidence. And this study, they report 28% incidence of myocardial or cardiac injury. Both studies, they define cardiac injury based on high troponin level. And they correlated the high troponin level to other markers like the high sensitivity CRP and the BNP. We know from other studies also that cardiac patients, patients with coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, cardiac arrhythmia, those are risk factor for severe COVID-19 disease and risk factor for non-survival. So we can see here that coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and arrhythmia they are risk factor for uh, death in a patient with COVID-19. This is not completely surprising, uh, taking into account what we know that the receptor for the SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for COVID-19, is the ACE2 receptor. And we know that the ACE2 receptor is expressed in the cardiac muscle. But if we look to what we know about cardiac injury and the high troponin in fact in the intensive care patients we know for a long time like around 40 percent of icu patients they have high troponin and this had been correlated with mortality also so the findings from the two chinese trials answer between 20 to 28 percent of high troponin on those patients is not very surprising it's not more than what is expected for any general ICU uh, population. So if we come to the question, how can the SARS-CoV-2 affect the heart? We have many theories. It can be direct viral invasion, can be the inflammatory response, the stress, the hypercoagulability, the atrogenic effect, the mechanical uh, pulmonary obstruction from the ventilator. So starting by the viral myocarditis, we know that the viruses, DNA or RNA viruses, they can cause viral myocarditis, and this included the experience with the influenza uh, 10 years ago. So it is, it will not be very surprising if the COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, the virus itself can invade directly the heart, taking into the account that the receptor is the ACE2 receptor. And from the beginning of the pandemic, there was uh, small case reports about patients with myocarditis or letters to editors. For example, this uh, case report, they uh, reported a case of acute uh, myopericarditis, but this was uh, based on cardiac MRI imaging uh, mainly. And one of the limits of this is that there was no endomyocardial virus, so there is no histological diagnosis. And we know from the recommendation that uh, to diagnose uh, myocarditis, viral myocarditis, it is uh, recommended to do endomyocardial biopsy for those patients. And the endomyocardial biopsy is the gold standard way to diagnose those patients. There is, in fact, uh, very little uh, case reports. I think this is the first one and the only one I can uh, find that there are there, there, there was an endomyocardial biopsy showing uh, viral particles in the myocardium. Of course, I, I appreciate that doing a biopsy for those patients is quite difficult if they are very sick, they are in shock state, either septic or cardiogenic shock. So this is the only case report I had seen about they can identify the viral particles in the myocardium. So when we look to the pathological findings in the autopsies, we have less evidence in fact. So there is no evidence of histological changes or there is no evidence of uh, direct invasion of the heart in this study. 
Some other autopsy study, they study 12 patients, 11 of them, they have cardiac uh, comorbidities, which confirms what we said earlier, that cardiac comorbidities are a risk factor for severity and mortality from the COVID-19. But while they said that, they said that the cause of this was uh, within the lungs or the pulmonary vascular system for most of those patients, and most of those patients, they have cardiac uh, comorbidities. They can find just in one case lymphocytic myocarditis seen in the right ventricle. So what we can conclude from this? While we cannot exclude completely there is viral myocarditis, and at least there is one uh, case report, after thousands of patients now and more experience, uh, we cannot see a ma a major large studies, observational studies, or autopsy reports showing uh, a, high, a very high incidence or high incidence of viral myocarditis. So viral myocarditis in COVID-19 is, is a possibility because there is the ACE2 receptor and there is a suggestion. But till now, we don't have enough evidence or large uh, studies uh, confirming this viral myocarditis. And then we are waiting more studies. Maybe this will be confirmed, but it looks like uh, less likely. The second possibility, which I think is more common, is septic cardiomyopathy. Septic cardiomyopathy means that there is a, a bacterial or fungal or virus infection, which by uh, binding to the toll-like receptor can cause uh, inflammatory response and injury to the heart. And the mechanisms of this can be uh, those cytokines, most importantly, a circulating uh, cardiac depressant uh, substance, but also it can be mitochondrial dysfunction or dysregulated calcium or nitric oxide. And looking to what happens in the COVID-19 and the hyperinflammatory state, what we call the cytokine storm, which involves many of the interleukins, especially interleukin-6, interleukin-1, and tissue TNF, uh, alpha, many of them are involved in septic cardiomyopathy. We can uh, suspect that there will be an incidence of septic cardiomyopathy uh, not rare in COVID-19 patients. So what is uh, septic cardiomyopathy? So septic cardiomyopathy has an incidence of about 40 to 60 percent within the first three days of uh, presentation to the intensive care. There is no consensus definition, and this is a major limiting factor, but a general agreement that it is an acute reversible condition. We diagnose it mainly with the echo, and it, is, uh, it results from the infectious process, and which can cause myocardial uh, depression through mitochondrial dysfunction or the inflammation itself. And it is important to understand that this pioneer study from 1986, they had shown that there is no uh, major problem with the coronary blood flow. So most of those patients, uh, they have normal or high coronary blood flow, but uh, low extraction of the oxygen, in fact. So the problem is not the coronary flow itself. It is beyond the coronary flow, either a microcirculatory problem or cellular or mitochondrial problem. So the septic cardiomyopathy can affect the left ventricle, can affect its systolic or diastolic function, can affect also the right ventricle. And uh, this, the only study I had seen, they did the biopsy and MRI of the heart, and they show a picture of inflammation and myocardial edema. All this uh, raises the question if uh, the control of the inflammation itself can protect the heart in those cases. All this uh, waits confirmation because our experience with the immunological management and the control of uh, the cytokines in sepsis had failed over the last 20 or maybe 25 years. And while we, uh, the diagnosis and uh, the, uh, the general agreement that it is a reversible condition, there is this study showing that those patients with ejection fraction less than 50% uh, after sepsis or with uh, coronary artery calcification, they have highest incidence of cardiac events uh, during the year after the, the occurrence of the sepsis. 
The other possibility, of course, is stress cardiomyopathy. And most commonly what we see is Takotsubo picture, which is epical ballooning syndrome, epical hypokinesia, and basal uh, hyperkinesis, which in some extreme cases can lead to left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Myocardial ischemia is, of course, a possibility in patients with COVID-19. There was a universal definition of myocardial infarction in 2018, and uh, the most common uh, myocardial injury and the infarction uh, described in the intensive care is what we call type 2 myocardial infarction, which is an imbalance between the supply and the demand. So the supply can be affected by the hypotension, the anemia, the low cardiac output state, but the demand also can be affected by the tachycardia, the hyperkinesia of the heart, leading to cardiac injury and cardiac ischemia, mainly second to this imbalance. Problem we face now in the intensive care and with the COVID-19 patients that many patients, they are elderly, they have hypertension, they have diabetes, they have atherosclerosis, they have coronary artery disease. So this balance is very critical between the supply and the demand. And any uh, small decrease in the supply or the coronary perfusion can lead to myocardial injury. But of course, we cannot exclude completely the classical type 1 myocardial infarction, especially that we know that there is an incidence of hypercoagulability uh, documented for those patients. So there are many uh, reports about uh, PEs, pulmonary embolism, and DVTs in those patients. Is, if this includes the coronary also and leads to uh, coronary artery disease and acute type 1 myocardial infarction, this waits to be confirmed in uh, studies in the near future, hopefully. The other thing and the last thing we should not uh, forget about is acute core pulmonale. Acute core pulmonale is not rare, incidence about 20-25% in the era of lung protective uh, ventilation in ARGS patients. And this is because the ARGS is associated with microthrombi, the hypoxemia itself, the hypercapnia, the pulmonary edema, the ventilator settings with hyperinflation and overdistension can squeeze uh, pulmonary vasculature and also the atelectasis. All those together can lead to increased pulmonary vascular resistance, pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular dilatation, and septal dyskinesis. So the hallmark diagnosis of acute core pulmonale is right ventricular dilatation and septal dyskinesis. And this had been studied, and the risk factors had been studied. And there is a score suggested upon a, a transesophageal studies, but the risk factor which had been identified are pneumonia as a cause of ARGS, high driving pressure more than 18, and the driving pressure is the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP, hypoxic index PF ratio less than 150, hypercamnia PACO2 more than 48. And they recommended that if the score is more than two, to do echo routinely for all patients. And you can see that the instance is going up with every uh, one point more on the score, reaching like if the score is four, like 70%. So COVID-19 patients will not be uh, surprising, again, that they have acute core pulmonary because they have a pneumonia. Most probably they are very hypoxic. Most probably we allow them uh, permissive hypercapnia and we put them on very high uh, ventilator settings so they have a high driving pressure. So most probably they will score high and they will need an echo to exclude acute core pulmonary. And the problem if this comes on top of septic cardiomyopathy, because as we said, septic cardiomyopathy can cause left ventricular systolic dysfunction in 30 to 50% of cases. And if there is increased right ventricular afterload and right ventricular systolic dysfunction, this will lead to right heart failure. So it is not surprising that there is, for example, this case report from New England Journal of Medicine about five patients. They diagnosed in one center in very short time 
five patients with acute core pulmonary, patients with COVID-19. Another two things we should not forget about. The first that there is an instance with ARDS, patient mechanically ventilated of patent foramen ovale, which if which and what happens if the right ventricular pressure is high, there will be a right to left shunt, which means hypoxia, which will not respond. So cardiac shunt and hypoxia not responding to uh, mechanical ventilation and high oxygen. And in fact, the treatment can be to decrease the right uh, right sided pressure by pulmonary vasodilatation or decreasing the PEEP. And one of the suggested treatment is, for example, nitric oxide. The other thing, of course, is that there is an incidence of pulmonary embolism, and this incidence I cannot quantify, but there is a suggestion 20-30%, which is maybe uh, more than what is expected in critically ill patients. So this is another cause of acute core pulmonary. The treatment is complex. It includes the catecholamines, fluids, pulmonary vasodilators, but most importantly, adjust the ventilator, treat the hypoxia, treat the hypercapnia, limit the driving pressure. So the take-home message, and uh, to sum up, cardiac injury is common in patients with COVID-19. Patients with cardiac history, they are at increased risk of, of severity and mortality from COVID-19. The problem is that we are facing uh, many possibilities. There is a wide spectrum of the cardiac affection. So monitoring is mandatory. And I think also imaging and the most available imaging is the echocardiography, bedside echocardiography to see where is the problem. Is it the right heart? Is it the left heart? It is, it, is it global? And how to manage the patient? So this is very essential to tailor the management. And we are waiting more uh, studies and more papers and more articles to understand better the disease. Thank you very much.